Welcome to the MSJC Internet Authoring Videocast. In this video, you'll be learning web browser basics. Our objectives for Session 1.1 are to define the terms associated with the Internet and the World Wide Web, differentiate between web servers and web clients, identify the name of the language used to create web pages, and understand how it is used. Identify the shared features of a modern web browser. Ensure easy access to previously visited websites. Efficiently navigate the web. Identify and manage cookies. Use the associated private browsing mode. Use the help features provided by each browser. And save and print web pages. Before we get to the differences between the Internet and the web, you must first understand what a data communications network is. So computers can be connected to each other in a configuration called a network. To enable computers to communicate with one another, they need to be connected to a device known as a data communications switch or hub. When networks are connected to each other, the system is called an interconnected network or intranet with a lowercase i. Notice in the graphic to the right there, we have two networks. The network on the left has three computers connected to a switch, and there's two servers on the network on the right connected to a switch. The switches then are connected to a device known as a router, and the router's job is to be able to switch communications or messages between networks. The internet with an uppercase I is a specific interconnected network that connects computers all over the world using a common set of interconnection standards. When you look at the graphic on the right there, the Internet is represented by a cloud, so you need to think of the cloud then as all of the routers and switches and cables, satellites, all the devices that are used as the infrastructure to connect the networks together. By the way, the Associated Press has a new style guide out, and they have changed the word Internet to a lowercase i. The part of the Internet, known as the World Wide Web, or the Web, is a collection of files that reside on computers called web servers. And these web servers are all connected to the Internet. When you use your Internet connection to become part of the Web, your computer becomes a web client. A web browser is the software that allows your computer to connect to, locate, retrieve, and display web content using the HTTP protocol. It is the HTTP protocol that makes the web the web. If you look at the graphic on the right, you'll see the three different web browsers, Chrome, Edge, and Firefox. Each one has a different web address typed in the address bar, but notice that they all begin with HTTPS. HTTPS is the secure version of HTTP. All web addresses will always begin with either HTTP or HTTPS. To get a deeper understanding of the concepts of the World Wide Web and the Hypertext Transfer Protocol, HTTP, I have a couple of links here for you of videos that I've done that explain those topics, so go ahead and give them a look. Another acronym that we commonly encounter on the web is the Hypertext Markup Language, or HTML. The standardized language that's used to create the web page is the Hypertext Markup Language. And within the HTML pages, we will often encounter hyperlinks. So HTML, the language that's used to build web pages, uses tags to create HTML elements. And those elements then provide semantics or the meaning and the structure of the contents of the web page. The top graphic on the right is the web browser displaying the web page. And then underneath of that, you see the actual document that was created, the HTML document, and the code, the way that it's written there. So you'll notice that on the first line, it has an open angle bracket, exclamation point, doc type, HTML, closed angle bracket. 
So that's called a document declaration. That tells the web browser that it's version HTML5 that it should interpret the rest of the code with. Then on line two, we have our first tag, which is the HTML tag. And it has an attribute, which is language. And it's defining that the language of the page is in English US. Notice that on line two, that's the opening HTML tag. And then down on line 12, that's the closing HTML tag. So it's very common in your HTML document to encapsulate, meaning enclose inside of different ele HTML elements inside of another HTML element. So the entire HTML document is defined by the beginning on line 2 and then the end of the HTML document on line 12. Now there's also two sections inside of an HTML document. Section 1 is the head section. Section 2 is the body section. Notice the head section has an opening head tag and a closing head tag. And then inside, encapsulated within that head, is a title element, which consists of an opening title tag, the text that we want to display as the title, Hello World, and then the closing title tag. Now what a title element does is it displays the text on the tab of the web browser. So going back to that top graphic, if you look at the very top of it where there's a little picture of a globe and then the text Hello World, the reason it displays the Hello World there is because the Hello World text was marked up using the title element. And then the text below, Hello World, which is larger and bold, that's because it's an H1 element. So inside of the body, you see we have an opening H1 tag, the text that we want to identify as the H1 element, and then the closing H1 tag. On this screen, we're taking a look at adding an anchor tag to our HTML document. So the anchor tags is how we create the hypertext links. These are instructions that point to the other HTML documents or another section of the same document, which would be called a bookmark. Hypertext links are also called hyperlinks or links. When a web browser displays an HTML document, it's often referred to as a web page. If you look at the graphics on the right, underneath the Hello World, you can see that that's the hypertext link that reads View MSJC Homepage. If you click on that, it will take you to the MSJC Homepage. And the code for that is down below. You can see on line 11, we've added an anchor element. So we start with an opening anchor tag. Inside of that opening anchor tag is the attribute href and the value that's assigned to it is the web address that the user will be taken to, that the browser will go to, when the user clicks on the text. So notice that the href value is a web address, https colon forward slash forward slash msjc.edu. And then between the opening anchor tag and the closing anchor tag is the text the user sees on the web page, view msjc homepage. If you'd like to view an animated explanation of how HTML works, I have a YouTube video that you can view by just putting that URL in your web browser. That'll take you to that YouTube video. So there are many different web browsers that you can use on your computer. They have similarities and differences, but they all have some version of the following. An address bar for displaying the URLs, the uniform resource locators that are used for locating the web pages on the web, the back and forward buttons for navigating among previously visited pages, tabs for opening multiple web pages, home, tools, view, favorites, feeds, and history buttons, or links to access the most common functions. Also, users can customize their browsers to suit their needs. In this graphic, we're looking at the common elements that we find in all our web browsers. So we have Chrome, Edge, and Firefox. Starting on the left, you can see the back button is being identified. Just to the right of the back button would be the forward button. In Edge, the forward button doesn't display unless you've already viewed multiple pages. Next to the forward button is the reload button. Now, notice it's reload on Chrome and Firefox, but it's called the refresh button in Microsoft Edge. Then you have the home button next to that. 
Anytime you click there, it'll take you to the default page that's been assigned to that home button. And we'll take a look at how you do that a little bit later. And then next to the home button, that is where the address bar is. That's where you type in the web address or the search information for the web browser. And you'll notice that these web addresses have a padlock next to them. So that indicates that you're, you're using the HTTPS, the HTTP secure protocol, to make the connection to that web browser. So that is an indication that when you're communicating with that particular web server, that all of the data between your web browser and the web server is being encrypted. Then on the right end of the address bar, you'll see that there's a star. That's the favorites button or the bookmark button, depending on which web browser you're using. And then on the far right, you'll notice there's a main menu for each of the web browsers. That's how you get to the additional features of the web browser. So to identify a particular web page's exact location on the internet, web browsers rely on an address called the Uniform Resource Locator, or URL. The URL is the address of a specific web page. Every web page has a unique URL. In the example we're looking at here, the URL has the protocol of HTTPS being used. So again, that's the secure HTTP. Then we have the server and domain information, and then we have the folder information. We'll take a look at that on the next slide. So every URL has four parts. The protocol that you use to transport the file between the web browser and the web server, the domain name of the computer on which the file resides, the path for the folder or directory on the computer in which the file resides, and the name of the file. And not always the name of the file, as in this example, we're only seeing the folder. There's a default file that is automatically loaded by the web server from that folder. So the first element in the URL is the protocol. It's always going to be either HTTP or HTTPS unless you're viewing a web page that's on your own computer. Then it'll actually have the protocol listed as file. After the protocol, there's the subdomain. So in this case here, that's the name of the actual web server, CIS. And that's followed by the domain, which is MSJC. So that's the corporation or the company that's the network where that server is attached to. And then we have the top level domain to the right of the domain. So that's called the TLD. So every company that's part of the web has to be attached to some top level domain, either .com or .gov or .edu or .net or .io. There's a lot of them out there now. There used to be only 13 when everything got started on the internet. So the way that it works is that your web browser actually uses a communication process with a server called a doma domain name server or a DNS server. And so it first sends a message to EDU looking for the MSJC domain. Once it gets the address for the MSJC domain, then it connects to and queries the MSJC domain's domain server for the server address of CIS. And so MSJC's server returns back. Here's the IP address for the CIS server. Then your web browser sends the actual request for the page that's in the support folder to the CIS server. And the CIS server then responds with the default page in that support folder. If you'd like to get into that process in a little more detail, at the very bottom there, I have a hyperlink for you that's uh, in the CIS server in the tutorials folder. It actually breaks down the URLs and kind of goes into a greater detail of how all that works. The two most common protocols used to transfer files on the internet are hypertext transfer protocol and the file transfer protocol. So remember, it's HTTP when you're using your web browser, but it is possible in some of the modern web browsers now to use FTP for strictly transferring files back and forth. So it won't display the contents of the file. It just allows you to copy a file up to a server or down from a server. And unless you have permissions to actually write to the server, you won't be able to copy files up there. But you may be able to download files using the FTP protocol. 
when you enter a URL into the address bar, the modern browsers will actually begin a search process based on the characters as you type them into the address bar. So if you know the full address of the website or the web page that you want to view, you can just type that in directly. But if not, you can just take a look at the list that the web browser starts building and you might see the actual web page that you're trying to connect to and click on it in the list. And if you don't see what's in the list, you can just type in a kind of a general keyword search and then let the search engine perform its search based on the text that you typed in the search box and it'll give you a page then that has all the results that it has found for you. And then usually one of those results will be what you're looking for. Part of navigating web pages is clicking on hypertext links. Most web pages that you'll view be viewing in your web browser will include links to other web pages. And a link might open a web page that's related to the original web page, be a link to a company, open a web page with related information or advertised product or service, or even open a menu with additional links as we show in this example here, which is using a hamburger menu. So if we look at that top right graphic, you notice that it, it's not hyperlink text, but it's a graphic called a hamburger menu. And if you move your pointer up to that graphic area, the pointer changes to a what I call a pointy finger, or the hand. That's how you know that that is a hyperlink that can be clicked on. In this particular case, when you click on it, it then opens up a list of options that are available for you that also will be hyperlinks that will then take you somewhere else within that website. Once you've navigated to several different web pages, then you'll have both the back and the forward button available to you. And so you can navigate through your history list, so the web browsers are keeping track of every page that you go to in what's called a history list. And so by clicking on the back button or the forward button, you can navigate back and forth through the, the pages that you've previously viewed. Next to the back and the forward button is the reload or refresh button in the case of Edge. And that loads a new copy of the web page that currently appears in the web browser. And new copy is not necessarily the best term there as a web browser actually caches all the web pages that you view. In other words, it actually saves them on the computer's hard drive. So when you click the refresh button, generally what it's doing is it's just reloading the page that it already downloaded to your hard drive back into the web browser. It's supposed to check with the web server to see if the file has changed or not, and if so, then the web server would send down a new page. But if the page hasn't changed, then really all you're doing is just reloading the page from your own computer's hard drive. And that's important in web development because we're constantly making changes to web pages and then wanting to view them in our web browser. And so sometimes those changes don't, aren't, aren't reflected uh, in our web browser. And so we have to clear our web browser cache to force it to go back to the web server and to get the, the newest version of the page that we've just edited. Modern web browsers allow you to have multiple web pages open at the same time, and so each is displayed in a tab in the web browser. So you can just simply click on the different tabs to view the different pages that you have open. If you want to add a new tab, you just click on the plus button that's to the right of the existing tab. That will allow you to type in a new URL and view a different web page. You can also right click on a link on a web page and that will give you a menu where you can choose the option open link in a new tab, open link in a new window, open link in an incognito window. And you can also use the control key when you click on a link to open it in a new tab. If you'd like to close a tab, then you just click on the close button, the X icon there that's on the tab that you want to close. Previously, we talked about the home button there on your navigation bar, and you can change which web page is displayed when you click on that home button. 
So the way that you do that is you click on the menu for the web browser and then in the list of options that you see you should see the settings option. You'll click on settings and in the case of the Chrome browser it will display a page that has a bunch of different options on the settings page and if you want to change the browser that opens from the, the home button you click on the on startup option. Once you do that you'll see this screen here so you can set it up so that the home button when you click on it will just open a new tab continue where you left off so if you'd close the web browser it'll take you back to the last page that you viewed or have it open a specific page or set of pages and so in this example we've added the canvas web page which is http msjc.instructure.com and if we wanted to we could add additional pages there that we would have open whenever we click the home button or we could set the current page that we're viewing as the page that opens when we click on the home button now once we've added a URL in there for a specific page to open on the home button we can always go back and open it you just click on the menu button on the right the three vertical ellipses there and that'll give you the choices of either editing the URL or removing it altogether. So the term bookmarks, which is what Chrome and Firefox call it, and favorites is what Edge calls it, are often used to describe web pages users save for easy access at another time. So there's a lot of times there's common websites or web pages that you want to reference and you want to be able to get there quickly so you can save them as a bookmark or a favorite. And you can add, delete, and organize these bookmarks or favorites into folders that best suit your needs and work style. The way that you create the bookmark is just click on the star in the address bar. That will let you add the page you're currently viewing into the bookmark or favorites grouping. And then also, if you want to edit your bookmarks, you can just use the bookmark manager from the web browser's main menu by just opening the web browser's main menu and then selecting the bookmark manager and you can see on the bookmark manager screen in the case of Chrome anyway it has its own URL which this is the exception to seeing HTTP, FTP or file as the protocol for the URL. Chrome actually has their own protocol designation if you look at the graphic on the left there, you'll see that there's the uh, bookmark folders on the left. You can add your bookmarks or your favorites into particular folders, group them together. And then on the right is a list of the actual bookmarks or favorites that you've previously saved within that particular folder. And then on the far right, you'll see, again, we have those three vertical ellipses, so we can click on those and that will get us to this menu where you can edit, delete, cut, copy, paste, open in a new tab, open in a new window, or open in an incognito window. So those are all the options you have for the bookmark. As I said previously, as you're browsing through the internet, each page that you view is being stored in the history list in your web browser. So you can modify the history list as well. You can delete recently visited sites. You can go back and recall a recently visited site. And so you'll find that history option inside of your web browser's main menu, or you can press Control H on your keyboard to open up the history list. Here we're looking at managing cookies. Cookies has a bad connotation for a lot of folks, and it really shouldn't. A cookie is just a small text file that a web server saves on your hard drive. And what the cookie does is it actually stores information about your visit to a specific website. And only the website that you visited that placed the cookie on your computer can actually view that cookie. When the site that you're visiting places a cookie on your computer, it's called a first party cookie. And then cookies that are placed by companies other than the company's website that you're visiting, that's called a third-party cookie. So most web browsers do allow you to block cookies from your computer to specify general categories of cookies, such as first-party or third-party. You can also go in and delete the cookies, but it's important to know that 
it says here some, but I would say most cookies will benefit you. It'll be keeping track of what you've put into a shopping cart. It will uh, keep track of what ads were previously displayed so you don't see the same ads over and over again. Uh, it will have your settings for a particular website. So it's important to consider the pros and the cons of cookies before you delete them all from your computer. So if you go to the settings page, you should have an option that's like privacy and security, which is what we see in Chrome. And that gives you these options then to uh, deal with your cookies. So you just click on the link in Chrome where it says cookies and other site data. And then you'll be viewing this screen here. So this allows you to view all cookies or allow, I should say, all cookies that websites want to put under your system. You, you can allow them all. Uh, you can block third-party uh, cookies when you're in incognito mode. So that's only when you're in the incognito mode. You can choose to block third-party cookies, and you can just block all cookies. And notice that's not recommended. So third-party cookies, you know, you might want to do that because that's usually coming from some advertiser, not the actual website that you were viewing. So as I've said, the web browser will actually store copies of the web pages that you have visited and uh, the URL is being added to the history list. So if you don't want that to occur, you can actually put your browser into what's known as private browsing mode, also known as incognito mode. So in Chrome, it's called in incognito. In Edge, it's called in private browsing. In Firefox, it's called private browsing mode. So private browsing mode can help protect your privacy and security. And just any time that you're in your web browser, if you do Control-Shift-N, that's the shortcut for switching into the incognito mode. So in general, when you're in the private browsing mode, your history list, your cookies, and the temporary internet files that you view save only while you're in the private browsing mode. Once you end the private browsing mode session, it deletes all that information. Downloads or bookmarks that are saved during the private browsing mode, they will remain on the computer even after the session ends. But remember, your internet service provider and your employer can still track pages that you visit during the private browsing mode. And that's only if you're on a computer that is controlled by your employer, not any of your personal computers. Web browsers do have extensive online help systems, including information about how to use the browser, how to customize the browser, how to protect your privacy. So if you just go to your browser's main menu and open it up, you should see the help option in that menu and then when you click on help you'll get several different options to choose from in the Google Chrome you can see they have an about Google Chrome what's new the help center and you can even report an issue if you think you've found a bug or have some sort of a problem you can also save web page content so the entire page that you're viewing or maybe just selected graphics or even selected portions of the web page text. So if you just right click on the web page, you should have the option to save that page. And then when you choose save, you'll get this little window that pops up where you type in the file name and then how you want to save it. Do you want to save it as the complete web page, as HTML only, or as a single file? And you can use Control S as the shortcut also for saving a web page. You can also save just an image from a web page if you want, a graphic or a picture instead of the entire web page. All you have to do is just right click on the image and you'll get the little menu, the context menu that you see in the graphic there open up. And that gives you the choice then to open the image in a new tab, save the image as, copy the image, copy the image address, or even create a QR code for the image if you'd like. Copying text from a web page is quite easy. Just wipe across the, the text. 
You control C from your keyboard or right click on the selected text and you choose copy. When you're viewing a web page, you can use the find tool to search for specific information on a web page. So you use control F as the shortcut to open up the find tool, type in your keyword, it'll identify how many instances within the web page that keyword occur, and then Using the Find Tools up and down arrows there, if there's multiple occurrences, you can actually navigate up and down in the web page to, to find each occurrence of the keyword. And the graphic on the far right there is just showing you that also the keywords are also highlighted within the web page for you. There might come a point when you want to print a web page to keep a printed page of the resource, to keep a copy of a receipt for an online purchase, to print a coupon to bring to a store. So you can use the shortcut control P or you can usually right click in the blank area of a web page and you'll get a context menu that'll have the print option appear. And once you do that, then the print preview window will show up and that'll show you how the current page that you're viewing will look when it's printed. And then you'll also have options as far as which printer you want to send it to, whether you want to print all the pages or just a selected page how many copies, whether the layout should be portrait or landscape, and whether you want to have color or not. Generally, web browsers download the files into a download folder on your hard drive, but you can change the folder where the downloads are being saved to. All you have to do is access the downloads page from the settings page of your web browser, and you can see there you can change the folder location where the download is going to be saved to and you can even set it up so the browser will ask you each time a folder each time a file is being downloaded what folder you want to save it into hopefully you understand that when you're viewing web pages the content of that page is owned by the organization that has distributed that page so a copyright is the legal right of the author or other owner of an original work to control the reproduction, distribution, and sale of that work. A copyright comes into existence as soon as the work is placed into the tangible form, such as a printed copy, an electronic file, or a web page. U.S. copyright law has a fair use provision that allows a limited amount of copyrighted information to be used for purposes such as news reporting, research, and scholarship. But you must always cite the owner of that material if you're going to put that into your own web page or use it in another document somewhere. So we've completed session 1.1. Moving on now to session 1.2, the objectives here are to use Chrome's Omnibox to complete calculations and conversions, use Chrome to translate web pages from one language to another, customize your Chrome browser with extensions and themes, scroll and zoom web pages easily and efficiently using Chrome, use the Edge address bar to search, use the reading list and reading view in Edge, Customize Edge by modifying default settings for searching and reading view. Use Edge to make and share web notes. Share web pages on social media. Customize your Firefox browser with add-ons and use the Firefox Find feature. So the modern web browsers, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, and all the others share basic features, but then they also have unique features that help them stand apart from their competitors. A lot of times these unique features that they add are quickly copied by their competitors and so you'll find that a lot of these are already cross-browser options. So users should investigate and decide which browser they want to use. As a web developer I suggest that you have them all installed on your computer so that you can actually view your web pages in all the various web browsers to make sure that they look consistent in each web browser. But as far as using the web browser, you're just looking for what browser is most comfortable for you when you're using a web browser, uh, seems most intuitive to you, offers the most efficient and effective experience for your user needs. 
So uh, some of the advanced features you'll find will be extensions. These are small programs that can enhance and extend the functionality of your web browser. Extensions are usually quite specific and narrow in their function. They have a very small footprint, usually appearing as a single icon on the toolbar after they're downloaded and enabled. In Google Chrome, they call their address bar an Omnibox. Omni standing for all-encompassing. And so the Omnibox can be used to meet a variety of needs, including using it as a calculator and using it as a conversion tool. So you can actually go into the Google Chrome address bar, type in 2 plus 2, press enter, and it'll give you the result, or any mathematical calculation for that matter. And uh, it also does conversions, which means you can convert uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius or meters to yards or vice versa. You can also use Chrome on foreign language websites. So if you go to a page that's actually originally written in a foreign language, you can have Chrome translated into your native language. So if you want to use your Chrome efficiently, it provides some methods for controlled scrolling. You can use the space bar to scroll down one page. You can use the shift key to scroll up one page. You can use the control key and the plus key to zoom in 500% on a page. You can use the control key and the minus key to zoom out on a page to 25%. You can also click the zoom icon to open up the zoom box, which will allow you to reset the page or change the percentage of the page. And if you have a mouse that has a scroll wheel on it, you can hold down your control key on the keyboard and then use the scroll wheel to zoom in and zoom out on a web page. Users can customize their Chrome browser using a theme, which usually is centered on a particular image or idea that makes the browser experience feel more personal and fun. The uh, dark theme is kind of popular these days. So themes will have a distinct color palette and an identifiable style that reflects the user's personality and interests. So Edge is the web browser that's preloaded on the Microsoft operating system. Uh, and that's in the newer ones, Windows 10 and, and Windows 11. So you won't find Edge on older versions of Windows. That will still have Internet Explorer because Edge is not supported on those older operating systems. So you have to have Windows 10 or 11 to be using Edge. And you could even download it on a different operating system should you need to. The uh, search engine that Edge uses is the Bing search engine by default. But in all web browsers now, you can actually change what the default search engine is. The way that Bing is set up is it displays the answers to questions that are entered in the search bar as the first hit in the results page. And it also may include links to additional information. Other hits follow the answer box. You can change how Edge searches the web. As I mentioned to you previously, you can switch to a different search engine if you want to, if you don't want to use Bing. So you just go into Edge's advanced settings. You can look for search engine in there, and you can delete Bing or add to another search engine to Bing. So once you make that change, then from that point forward, you, you'll be using whatever search engine you've designated inside of Edge. Edge also has a reading list and a reading view. The reading list will help you manage your online reading. And the reading view provides a streamlined and less cluttered view of the selected reading material. One of the cool features that Edge has is the ability to annotate your web pages. The way that this works is you can use Control plus Shift plus S or you can open up the main menu in Edge and then choose the option Web Capture and you'll get a little box that gives you the options of capturing an area or capturing the full page. Once you've made that choice, then you'll see the screen that's in the graphic there where you have the Draw menu which allows you to choose colors and set the thickness of the line for the pen that you're drawing with. And notice it has an eraser as well. So the web page that you're viewing now, you can, you can draw on it, you can add text to it, and then you can save it or share it that way as well. So you mentioned before, one of the advanced edge features is the reading view, but the reading view is only available if the page that you're viewing supports the edge reading view. 
If it does, you'll know it because up on the navigation bar at the top of the web browser, you'll get this little book icon. And so you can use that to actually read the contents of the page for you. Firefox is an open source, free web browser developed by the Mozilla Foundation. And open source just means that the copyright holder, in this case Mozilla, has given others the rights to study, modify, and distribute its software. Firefox is easy to customize. It allows for a drag and drop modification to its main menu choices. It allows users to customize the menu to suit their particular needs. And it uses add-ons like all the browsers do now. Chrome calls them extensions to enhance and extend the functionality of the browser. A couple of other web browsers out there that I wanted to bring to your attention. Brave was developed by Brendan Eich, and Brendan Eich is the creator of the JavaScript programming language. In fact, JavaScript is one of the most popular programming languages out there now, especially with the addition of the Node.js server. So the Brave browser is just another open source browser. And then the Tor browser is very cool because it has a built-in VPN. So a virtual private network, the way that it works is when you're using the Tor browser, as you type in a URL, that URL is actually sent to a Tor server. And what the Tor server will do is it'll actually change the IP address that's being used then to, com to communicate with the web server. So that way you're protected in that nobody knows what the IP address is of the web browser that made the request to the web server. So that's even more advanced than the uh, incognito mode. Remember in, in the incognito mode, your ISP, and if you're on your one of your employer's computers, they uh, both know what websites that you're going to if they really wanted to track it. In this case here, that's not possible. So that's it for this lecture. Until next time, happy browsing. If you like this video, please click the like button and leave us a comment down below. I also would appreciate it if you would subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also click the notification bell so that you'll be notified when new videos are posted.